So in complement to the parametric modeling of our interferometric data, I have of course mentioned the possibility of directly building up images from the analysis of these measurements. A priori, the recipe is quite simple. We did, after all, follow our recommendations and spent significant amount of time observing a given target, uh, taking advantage of the rotation of Earth and of the multiple locations of our telescopes forming multiple baselines, and we were able to acquire a significant amount of measurements of the visibility function at uh, a large number of distinct UV uh, positions, positions in my uh, UV plane. Those many measurements of the visibility uh, help me or us build a, a two-dimensional map of the visibility function gamma. And we should be able to simply uh, rely on our good old friend, the Venzeli Zinicki theorem, to invert this uh, visibility map gamma uh, to produce directly the image of the target we were observing. Now, if that sounds like too good to be true, you are right. There are several reasons that make that uh, the reality is unfortunately not as pretty as this ideal plan. Indeed, despite our best effort, there is a difference between the theoretical uh, visibility, complex visibility function gamma and the actual measurements we are um, we can get access to. Um, despite our best effort and the fact that we've acquired many, many points, you have to realize that those points do only cover a very small uh, fraction of the surface area that this uh, entire UV plane actually represents. And uh, the data that we have is actually quite sparse. And if that were not enough, some of that data is actually missing. In most places, we are indeed able to actually get access to at least the visibility modulus, but um, we've seen on a couple of occasions that we never get access to the phase, which means that 50% uh, of the information is gone, unless we uh, rely on tricks like differential phases or closure phase that we've seen before, in which case we get access to a partial uh, amount of that phase information. That's unfortunately not sufficient in order to simply uh, rely on Wenzeler Zanicki to directly invert that relation and go back to producing an image of our target. And so we're going to have to uh, use another plan, rely on some other approach in order to make up our images. But before going ahead, maybe it's a good time to uh, take a step back and think about what an image actually is. And so here is a very simple example. Uh, we're just zooming on the image of some object. And look at what that really fundamentally is. And fundamentally, that image is nothing but a matrix of pixels, um, say for example 100 by 100 pixels, and my image is really nothing but a collection or a list of uh, pixel values that, um, that describe the, the brightness uh, that is sampled by the pixel locations. And so one way to think about what an image actually is, is to think of it in terms of a parametric model, which is why we talked about parametric models before getting into the imaging game. Um, the difference here is that instead of uh, parametric models made of one, two, three, or even 10 parameters, if we have an image of 100 by 100 pixels, then that means we're going to have not five or 10, but 10,000 degrees of freedom to our, um, to our parametric model. So we're really going into a, a mathematical problem of a much larger dimension than in the somewhat simple 
uh, parametric models we've looked so far. So we start with an image, something that we believe would be uh, a very good starting point to describe the object we have actually looked at. Uh, that could very well be because uh, we have an idea of what it is we are observing or we are relying on prior observations uh, carried out by other groups of research or even by ourselves. And so this is our proposition. This is what our image, uh, um, the, the image of the object we are observing uh, should uh, be. Now we can use this image or this uh, list of pixel values, uh, we can use this in order to predict what the theoretical complex visibility should be uh, simply relying on uh, our good friend, the Venzi-Lodzenke theorem. So here it is again for whatever image I've plugged into uh, as the input of my um, data processing software, this is what my complex visibility should theoretically be for the entire UV plane in terms of amplitude and phase. And this transition is really direct application to the events of the Zanicki theorem. Now we know that we don't have access to the entire UV plane. However, we also know exactly where we've put our telescopes and where uh, the, the orientation of our baselines relative to the sky at any given time. And so uh, we are actually able to sample that complex visibility function in amplitude and phase in the right places in order to extract our actual uh, visibility measurements, the ones that we should be making if we were to observe an object exactly like the one uh, we've plugged into our system at first. And to do so, the only thing we really need is a model of our instrument, something that tells us uh, exactly what spacing we have between telescopes, what is the relative orientation of their baselines, and uh, what wavelength we are carrying our observations. And so from that model, we are able, uh, using the output from the Venzi-Terzanicki theorem, able to predict what the visibilities should be and what our closure phases should be. What is the next natural step? It is, of course, to compare these predicted observables to the actual data we required. And um, we, this is where we're going back to the early discussion on uh, testing our hypothesis here. We're going to evaluate the probability density function for our hypothesis, that is, our, our current image, and we're going to compare it against the, uh, the actual properties of our data and somehow uh, find a criterion that helps us uh, maximize this probability. Um, if that probability is not uh, good enough or we think we should be able to improve on the match that we observe between the data and our model, then we're going to uh, rely on some uh, optimization procedure that is going to output a new image and so we are going to simply uh, cycle over this um, system as many times as it takes in order to end up with a satisfactory uh, match between our data and uh, the model that we've produced. In which case, at which point we will be able to say, well this is uh, the image that we uh, believe best reproduces uh, the properties of the data. So this is what our object looks like. Now we need to uh, look in details as to what comes into play when we go about comparing the model to the data. What, if you remember the notations we've used uh, very early in uh, this section of the course, what we want to maximize is really the posterior probability density function for the hypothesis we'd like to test, which is uh, the image we'd like to produce. Um, and uh, we know, because thanks to the simple Bayes theorem, that that is actually a, a combined probability that relies on primarily on two terms that we've identified as the likelihood that quantifies 
the match between the, um, the data and the model itself. And another uh, probability, which we've labeled the prior, uh, which includes some uh, additional information we have about the object or uh, the data itself. The likelihood is, um, instead of being um, a function of three or five parameters, is going to be a function of the 10,000 parameters that uh, are required in order to build an image of 100 by 100 pixels, for instance. Which means that, although I have represented here uh, the likelihood as a, a one-dimension uh, distribution here, is actually going to be a function in a 10,000 uh, dimensional space. And so you can guess that we are going to get into some pretty heavy uh, computationally intensive optimization procedures in order to find the maximum of the likelihood function uh, for these types of problems. So the uh, one way to think about it is that it, we have a distribution function which is in a uh, space of dimension p, so we have a distribution to the power of p, one way to think about it. What that also tells you is that, of course, uh, because we have so many degrees of freedom, it's going to require a lot of data in order to constrain the problem. And we are going to have to rely on optimization algorithms, and so there's a whole bunch of them from the sim somewhat simple conjugated gradient. If we are very lucky and the data is nicely behaving, then we can rely on simple approaches like uh, downhill simplexes and or con uh, conjugate gradient, these sort of things. If the data is a little more difficult to deal with and the likelihood exhibits multiple uh, local um, optimums, and in this case, we're going to have to rely on more advanced more computationally intensive things like uh, simulated annealing or uh, what we call Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms, MCMCs for short. Now, the prior ends up being a huge player in this game here. And in the context of imaging, usually the dealing with the prior is actually something that is referred to as regularization. And the idea here is indeed to make the image look more regular. There's a couple of things that, uh, if we were to only deal with the likelihood, can lead us to some uh, silly situations, like uh, predict. If you just are trying to uh, optimize the values for the likelihood function, nothing actually fundamentally prevents anything from uh, producing negative pixel values, for example, and we know that the brightness of an object can never be negative. And so there are ways you can actually enforce uh, this, this type of knowledge, and that is to use uh, tools like regularization functions. And there are different types of regularizers that are possible, depending on what, uh, what sort of uh, conditions you want to enforce on the data. For instance, you could very well uh, want to enforce the fact that uh, because you know that the object is uh, stellar-like or looks like a star or very compact, then you can enforce the condition for compactness that is going to try to concentrate most of the flux in that image onto a few pixels instead of just spreading it all over the place. You could also uh, want to try to enforce the fact that uh, the function, the image, has to be a smooth uh, distribution of uh, light. Um, we don't see too many objects being spiky or anything like this, and so this is not such a silly way to, uh, to actually uh, enforce um, onto our image. And finally, there's this uh, whole idea of preventing the local pixel values from getting negative, and one way to do so is to use a quantity uh, that uh, is called entropy, that uh, you try to, uh, that you use in order to prevent uh, negative values from happening. You end up in a situation where you have to optimize how much trust you put in your data and the likelihood analysis uh, 
and how much trust you put in the prior information you're injecting uh, into your regularization procedure. And in practice, uh, there's a lot of um, software that has been developed, uh, software packages that already exist that you can use to help you solve these types of problems. And so uh, this is why you have things like BSMM, Myra, uh, Wizard, Makim, or Squeeze more recently. And um, I just wanted to point out that a lot of this stuff is ongoing research effort. And so uh, maybe we still have, we're still looking for the ideal uh, solution when it comes to, uh, to imaging of interferometric data.